Production funding for Ruckus has been provided by gifts from Dave and Jamie Cummings, the Fred and Lou Hartwig family, Peter and Barbara Gattermeyer, the Courtney S. Turner Charitable Trust, John H. Mize, and Bank of America N.A. co-trustees, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to Ruckus, our weekly food for thought fight over the news of the day and the trends of the times. I'm Mike Shannon. The Ruckettes join me shortly in our topics this week. Future pension tension at City Hall. What about the future of streetcar expansion? And are Democrats all in on Medicare for all? Plus, of course, roast and toast. But we start with our newsmaker segment and look at one of the city council races to be decided on June the 18th. There are 12 council positions. Six are elected at large, that is citywide. Six are elected by voters within the district. Our guest this week is running district-wide in the third district on the city's east side. She just finished a stint as president of the Kansas City, Missouri School Board. Melissa Robinson, welcome to Ruckus. Thank you so much for coming in. Well, thank you for having me. So your recent experience on the school board, mm -hmm. will that be an asset to you if you serve on the city council? Absolutely. When you think about collaboration, how to build strong policies, how to uh, not micromanage, but uh, make sure that the administration has the lane and the room to do their work and to deliver. Um, but listening to the people and making sure that their agenda is heard and that um, developing a school district in which uh, people can be proud of um, in that improvement process all translates into how do we build um, a better city. There were some dramatic changes for the Kansas City School District during your tenure. Absolutely, we've um, improved um, tremendously and that improvement started before I got there, but definitely um, we participated in uh, continually to close the academic achievement gap between young people and building quality staff and then ensuring that our uh, CEO had the room to do his to, to do his job. Superintendent. Our, superinten Mr. our Bedell. superintendent. Yeah. What uh, are a couple of the major issues of concern to you that would affect the residents of the third district? Um, one of the major things, yes, we have a lot of challenges in the third district, but we have a lot of people that are working very hard at the neighborhood level. They need to be supported. Um, their plans need to be advocated for. And so I uh, look to ensuring that our Regular everyday citizens have a power, have a voice in what they want to see when they look outside um, their windows. And so, yes, that translates into safe neighborhoods, a strong um, education system that they can depend on. And that's not a, oftentimes a municipal lane, but there's certainly opportunities for us to collaborate with the education system. I'm making sure that there are living wage jobs and excellent city services that they can depend on. When you go through major parts of the third district, there are huge amounts of solid waste, large bulky items, illegal dumping. And so we have to begin to address those things and make sure that we have a third district that we can be proud of. And 18th and Vine is within the third district, the Jazz yes. Museum, Baseball Hall of Fame, Negro Baseball Hall of Fame. Uh, are you optimistic about the future of that part of the district? I am very optimistic. I think because of the city, because the city has participated financially in building the infrastructure, we can now look at how we can draw in some public uh, private investments and partnerships to ensure that the city's not the only one on the hook that's fitting the bill. But then the opportunity for entrepreneurship and small business and full Tennessee throughout the district is a uh, huge concern and something that we think um, we can do. And so we're very excited about the future of 18th and Vine. There's a lot of things happening. We're proud of the decisions that the city has made. We want to make sure that the surrounding neighborhoods, uh, specifically those historic neighborhoods, such as Parade Park, have a strong voice in what they see, again, outside of their window. Uh, crime is a concern in the 3rd District. Uh, let me ask you a question that has been discussed for years in Kansas City, the police board. Would it be more effective, do you think, if it were under local rather than state control? 
Accountability is a strong factor when you talk about performance. And when we think about ways that we could support our Kansas City Police Department and having that accountable relationship, I think that governance is a critical issue in that. And we have to really look hard about how that oversight happens. So I'm certainly open to and would advocate for us taking a hard look um, and learning lessons from what's been done in St. Louis to say, okay, let's maybe not do it that way. But um, if there is um, that energy and that decision to 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 bring it back to local, con to bring it to local control, then um, you wouldn't be opposed to that. I would not be opposed to that. But we need to have the conversation. We need to um, do a deep dive. We need to make sure we do it right, and we need to make sure the governance structure. It, that's important and that's key. Got to stop there. Out of time. Thanks so much for coming in. Pleasure to meet you and good luck in the campaign. Well, thank you so much. Sure enough. That is Kansas City, Missouri City Council candidate Melissa Robinson. Her opponent will be our guest next week. Now let's meet the panel and start a ruckus. Patrick Tuey is director of municipal policy at the Show Me Institute, a free market think tank. Attorney Patrick McInerney is with the firm of Spencer Fain. On the non-Patrick side of the panel, Mary O'Halloran is a media and communications consultant. And Crosby Kemper III is executive director of the library system and host of KCPT's Meet the Past and Centropolis programs. Looks like a fun foursome. So now let's find out if it is a fun foursome. It is more than a month before Kansas City voters will pick a new mayor and city council. There are lots of candidates and even more issues. The Kansas City Star says one of the least mentioned is potential pension tension at City Hall. The city's various pension programs for police, firefighters, and other city employees, while apparently in decent shape, continue to grow in cost. When the 2008 recession hit, the funds lost value, the city reduced contributions, and the current state of underfunded pension programs resulted. While there are no easy solutions, the president of the Firefighters Union had a suggestion, focus on funding the pension programs instead of on tax increment financing deals. And when I read that, I thought, you know, that sounds a great deal like something Crosby Kemper might have you said. You know, it's nice to know somebody's been listening to me <laughs> over, the, over all this time. And it's true. We're spending about $150 million plus uh, in subsidizing corporations every year. Mm -hmm. Our, uh, our pension plans are about $800 million in the hole, and that's before we do a real independent actuarial study, which will put it even more in the hole. Uh, we can't fix the streets. Uh, we, we're, uh, uh, we've got a huge crime rate. Um, there are a lot of things we're not doing, affordable housing that we could do, uh, but we can't do right now because we're spending too much money on other things, like streetcars, which we'll get to uh, in a minute. But to fix the pension plan, we have to be focused on it. No, and you're right, nobody, nobody in this campaign for mayor or city council is focused on this. We're going to have to spend some money. It's going to go up to 15% at least of the general fund. And that means we're going to have to spend less money on something else. And I haven't heard any candidate in this race talk about what they're not going to spend money on. Uh, Patrick McInerney, uh, funding pension programs, that's really something very serious that people worry about and the city council members and the mayor have a serious obligation to take care of, don't you think? No, no question. Uh, I mean, it's one of the reasons, in fact, Brad Lemon, who's president of FOP, said it's one of the ways that we attract all people to be police officers. So it's a, it's a critical component. It's not very sexy and nobody wants to talk about it. And everybody now has the luxury of saying, let's wait till July and see what that report looks like because the, the mayor's task force on pensions is uh, their work won't be done until July. So it's it's kind of an easy out for the mayoral candidates and it's disappointing that nobody's willing to talk about what the priorities are. And we uh, had a be. task force before. That we did. It seems right. like we always have a task force well, reporting it's, it's on a, something. It's a simple choice. It's either decreasing benefits, increasing uh, uh, contributions, or making some other minor adjustments. I mean, those are the, the ways to go here. Mary, Kansas City, Missouri is not alone in facing this kind of a problem, is it? No, apparently not. Chicago, New York, <laughs> all kinds Kansas. of other places. Kansas. Oh, well, <laughs> yes, the state Jersey. of Kansas, indeed. Well, I, I, think, uh, I think that Jolie Justice's <clears throat> position on this is, is in some ways brave. I mean, one of the easiest things to do uh, as a candidate for office is to promise that whatever benefit people currently have 
will be continued on or even improved upon uh, once you get in office. But, uh, you know, she said, I'm not going to second guess these people because there's a very serious group of people who are looking at uh, best practices for pension reform around the country and how sustainable any new system would be and would it be adequate to the task. I mean, you can't expect, and Patrick, you're so right, that is the core issue. How are we going to attract the best and the brightest and the strongest and the bravest to firefighting or police force What, what did she promise? To pay attention to the no, task she didn't. Force report? My point is, she did. She didn't go around. She didn't That's the anything. easy what, what, stuff. But, but what she said is, I'm going to wait. Mary. I'm not going to second guess these very. Th this bright is people. a cost. This is not. We're going to have to do something that's going to cost us some money. We know it's going to cost us some money. Where is that money going to come from? And nobody's willing to talk about it. And I say that's total avoidance. Where should it come from? Uh, well, it Got should any come ideas, the $153 million <laughs> that we're spending building headquarters buildings for corporations, subsidizing $17 million garages for yuppies and luxury housing downtown, should come, it should come from TIF. Is there any likelihood, Patrick uh, Tui, of renegotiating some of these deals with the uh, groups? Well, that would be great. Uh, I, you know, I don't know what the politics will allow for. The firefighters and the police are powerful unions in the city. Uh, but the problem, the, the broad problem is uh, cities overpromise very generous pension plans and then don't fund them because they're too generous. And, and so the we people who do problem. the promising aren't around to see the consequences. Amen. That's absolutely right. They're gone by the time uh, the problem hits the fan. So it's easier to say, give them more money sure. and then not well, worry about the nature about of municipal board. politics. Give, 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 and by the time the bill arrives, I'll be long gone. All right. While mayor and council candidates will be discussing a lot of items, one issue they probably won't be discussing is streetcar expansion to the plaza and UMKC. There's really not much to discuss because the Federal Transit Administration rejected the city's application for a grant to cover half of the $316 million cost. Half is paid by patrons in the district where the proposed line would be built. Local streetcar authorities say they are not surprised by the rejection. In fact, they expected it. They believe a grant will be forthcoming in the near future when planning is more complete. So do you think the optimism of the streetcar enthusiast is justified? We'll start with Patrick, then go to Mary. Uh, the optimism is laughable, and of course they didn't expect it. I've been writing about this for years. The Federal Transit Administration, which gives out the grants they were hoping to get, not only didn't include Kansas City, but said we want to zero out the fund in 2020. Other administrations before the Obama administration did not fund streetcars. They are incredible wastes of resources. But as far as uh, uh, the Obama administration wanting to spend stimulus dollars, he lavished funds on laughable streetcar programs around the country, and Kansas City took the bait. And so what we've done basically is, is try to commit public funds to match a federal grant that may never arrive. The, the good news in all of this is that the Jackson County judge that approved the expenditure said, the, CID, the TDD, the city, may not uh, raise sales or property tax until the other funding, the federal funding, is in place. So if we don't get the federal grant, and I don't expect that we will, uh, the, the, the taxes for the streetcar won't go up, and it may be that we are eternally left with this 2.2-mile party bus. <laughs> party bus. <laughs> All right, Mary, what, what, what about the, the question I started with Patrick about? Do you think the optimism of the streetcar enthusiast is justified? Oh, I, I, if there's anything that's optimistic and, and joyful little addition to our city, that is it. Pat, Patrick, we have $6 billion of economic development. No, garbage. Uh, that's it's garbage. garbage. It's garbage. That's absolute garbage. garbage. Oh, excuse me. Well, that, that comes from... You can't from, point to any comes from Jan Jan Hang on, Patrick. Let, let Jan Markison is the uh, elected chair <laughs> of the uh, Main Street yeah. uh, Transit... What's it Authority. called? Authority. The yeah. Transit Development District. By 3,000 And people. was elected. That's a public office. By 3,000 And by people. the way, the people who voted for the extension, if we're talking about the extension to UMKC, 75% of the people who voted said yes we, we, for the, to the assessment and to yeah, the tax. Mary, and we have to reinforce, people. you know, let's mention that this is not a tax on the entire city. And by the way, way back in the day, I thought it would be better if we, if we had a city It's a gerrymandered district. They, they picked and they drew the boundaries specifically to capture all the yes votes. They, ex, uh, <laughs> they, they excised the buildings that they thought were politically uh, uh, problematic. 
uh, and and it doesn't dri drive any economic development. Oh, please. No, please. Right. So, well, Mary, there's you, no you, research well, that supports well, I, that. I'm, Mary, you I'm think there's been economic development as a result yeah, well, the, of the streetcar the downtown, and there, there would be if it's extended to the plaza. Indeed, I, I, that's, that's one of the main reasons why Sam Graves and Sharice Davids, who sits on his committee in Congress, are dedicated to this project, as well as as Roy Blunt and the senators okay. in uh, in Kansas, the political support for it is tremendous. And by the way, have you ridden it lately? It's such a such it's a, a, it's a party wonderful. Bus. No, it's fun. Yeah. Right. It is. Get Crosby in now. Uh, Mary says there has been economic development success because of the downtown line, and will be economic success if it's extended. Do you disagree with that? I completely disagree with it. It's all subsidized. The, besides the, the, the party bus itself uh, being subsidized, we'll spend a billion dollars over 10 years on the streetcar. A billion dollars if you count in the depreciation, you count in the moving of the utilities, the operations, a billion dollars. And then we're subsidizing the businesses that are, that are going in. The new businesses are all subsidized. Uh, it's a huge cost to the city, a gigantic cost. It's not creating jobs. There are no new jobs from this, no new jobs, and there's no economic growth in Kansas City. We're slowing down our economic growth precisely because we're subsidizing stuff like this. Patrick, what do you think about the streetcar and its impact on economic development? Well, I think this is a non-story. I think we ought to talk about this in a year because <laughs> there's not a single project that's been approved before it got to the engineering stage. And we're not at the engineering stage. So, right. you know, and I know that there's a there's the prospect of it being completely defunded in 2020. We'll see how that shakes out. I doubt that's gonna happen. That's not a politically palatable uh, situation uh, or, or position to take. So the story's gonna be next year. The story's gonna be uh, once we get past design and into the engineering phase, then do we get funded. If we get shut off next year, that's a reason Then what to happens? That's a reason to talk. Well, well, then nothing happens. You said the, the, the taxes can't be increased, so that's the right. local patrons can't pay the whole cost. And the cost. city will have spent a lot of money out of the general fund. One of the advocates this. for the streetcar said, well, if that happens, we may consider uh, defederalizing. I don't know what that means, but hold on to your pocket. Well, you know, Mike, there are very few projects like this that exceed expectations as much as this streetcar has. You know, how many million? Six, six million rides in three years. Well, it's free. Way, it's free, of yeah. Of course. It's why free. Not? Yeah, why, why not ride it? It's they free. actually figured out it would cost more to charge. That's a Mary, when I lived on 18th for... Street, I was the only person, I mean literally, literally yeah. the only person who took it to work. I, I saw but you're not you, now, you, you, Crosby. You Have you the, been out on lately? It's packed. You, you put a picture on not social, at 7 a.m. Crosby, you put a picture on social true. media. I recall <laughs> yeah. you were the lone writer yeah. on the. Yeah, on the and speaker. that happened every time I wrote it to uh, work. Final quick question: What about the plans to move the streetcar line to uh, Berkeley Park? Well, the, oh. go, going to a place where there, there is almost nobody, taking that, that, how many people want to go to Berkeley Park, and they, we, have, we have some new apartment buildings there, but it's a tiny group of people. Uh, again, it's typic, that's a typical way of looking at this. They think they're going to increase density. You, we know from the studies that you don't increase density uh, with, with streetcars, particularly in cities where, that aren't dense to begin with. It's, it's ridiculous. All right, let's continue. If Medicare for all comes to fruition, one man is likely to get most of the credit or all of the blame. He's Senator Bernie Sanders of Vermont, a Democratic Socialist who first introduced Medicare for All legislation a decade ago. Sanders says the plan now has widespread support in the House and Senate, and he says a poll shows support from the American people, including a majority of Republicans. But polls aren't legislation, and Bernie is not yet president. There are concerns about what this program would cost, its impact on the insurance industry, and what it would do to the current Medicare program, widely endorsed by its senior citizen users. So, Patrick McInerney, you think we're getting close to Medicare for all? No, we're not anywhere close. And it is, it's one of the most moronic political ideas that's out there. Um, the, the reason Democrats stormed through 2018, and the reason we won 40 plus seats in the House last year was not on Medicare for All, it was on the Affordable Care <coughs> Act. Because people, and not people in the cities, people outside cities rely on the Affordable Care Act. It needs to be fixed, and the Democrats won on fixing affordable care last year. Right. If, if we pivot, if, that, if my party pivots and, and offers to turn 
this system upside down, we play right into Trump's hands, we play right into Mitch McConnell's hands, and it's, it's moronic. Well, it seems like a number of candidates running for the Democratic nomination have pivoted and said they endorse Medicare for All. Yeah, when Kamala Harris was asked about having uh, 177 million Americans give up their private insurance, she said, get over it, we have to move on. <laughs> uh, you know, we have uh, a program similar to Medicare for All in the United States. It's called the Veterans Administration. And if anybody's happy with how the Veterans Administration has been handling costs and treating its patients, well, that's what we're going to get if we get Medicare for All. I agree with Patrick. It's an absolutely a bad idea policy-wise and probably politically. Well, what about the cost of Medicare for All? We know Social Security and Medicare, we keep being told that they're both running short of money. What would happen if you had Medicare for All? Just Medicare itself, forget Medicare for All, just Medicare itself bankrupts the United States some point in the 2030s or 2040s, if you talk to any economist. Add Medicare for All in, uh, and free, free college, don't forget that, in the Green New Deal, and we're talking about doubling or tripling uh, the taxes that all Americans pay. So it's just, it's not affordable. It's, uh, I, agree, I agree with uh, Pat McInerney. I, you know, we, uh, fix the Affordable Care Act or whatever we're calling yes. it today uh, is probably- It's part the of the fabric of this country. Probably, it is. The, the truth that Republicans need to understand, and I think a lot of us do, is that we do have national health care at this point. We basically have national health care and people are happy with their version of it, whatever it is. Um, and we need we need to add a few people into it, and we need to make it a lot more efficient. You bet we need to add. <laughs> I would really agree with you about that. And in Kansas, we need to expand Medicaid, which is 36 states have done, and 150,000 people mm -hmm. waiting for Senator Denning to get his, Well, the legislature has together. ended its session, and uh, Medicaid it have. And expansion did not take place. It'll probably happen next year, but in the meantime. That's what we said last year. Um, but the endless right. increase of cost of Medicaid and Medicare has well, got to stop. Well, of course, and those are, it, those are issues in and of themselves. But listen, the reason the people <laughs> want to expand Medicare is because people like Medicare. It's a functional, right. wonderful uh, social program oh, in this country, wonderful. other than Social Security. It's second best. You and, just can't afford it. And Bill Clinton proposed that we move it down to 55 because that's where people generally have a hard time getting a, a new uh, program if they've laid off from their jobs. But I, I am, of course not, we're not going to have Medicare for all, but that doesn't mean we can't talk about having, instead of this patchwork quilt, a very costly, ineffective medical uh, system in this country. We expand the one we know works. Uh, but you do know a majority of your team, the 300 people who are running for president, have all endorsed it, yeah. right? Well, they're, they're, they endorse the idea just like Green New Deal well, is a statement and, and of they, values. And Patrick, they say health care is a right. Is it? No. Is health care a right in this no, country? You cannot have a right to a service. No, because no. Assault weapons are a right. Well, you don't need it. Yeah. Well, there is a constitutional yeah. amendment about guns. There's actually, not about health care. You may have covered that in law school. But, uh, no, you don't have a right to a service. And if you have a right to a service, what that means is the government must compel somebody else to provide it. And we dabbled with that for a little bit in the United States, and it didn't turn out well. So it is a, it is a nice what? thing to have. It is a good thing to have. But compelling service from other people... Uh, by declaring health care a right is, is absolutely wrong. By so, the way, Patrick, and do you know that the uh, vast majority of veterans do like the veterans uh, medical service? Well, the ones that don't it's tend very to Very happy with it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> not everybody. But it's but been changed as it not, has. Uh, every, and, and everything needs to be changed. Veterans have choice. Now they can go to a private Indeed. facility. It's not been well run. still not Now well run. we're going to go to the soapbox <laughs> for roast and toast where the Ruckheads have 30 seconds each to analyze synthesize or strategize and we're going to start with Mary. Well I don't know maybe synthesizing for this one I looking at uh, the race in Kansas City for mayor which is really so important I uh, a lot of emphasis been put on who gets uh, which endorsements and so on but I think one of the things I the, the person I'm supporting is Jolie Justice and one of the reasons is when I look at her record of service <laughs> to the city as a, as a senator and her success most everywhere she's gone in life to work. But people probably don't know what her day job is. She is in charge of, of Shikardi and Bakeson's pro bono legal services and their legal services all over the country for people who cannot afford a lawyer and is really good at it. People should know that about her. Patrick Tui. 
uh, a roast to the folks at Bike Walk KC, the activist organization asking taxpayers to spend $400 million to, among other things, add more bike lanes to Kansas City streets. Only one-tenth of one percent of Kansas Citians bike to work, but Bike Walk KC claims the plan would save 36 lives, create over 12,000 jobs. But the most cursory examination of these claims show them to range from being gross exaggeration to complete misstatements of their own research. The council should reject this plan if for no other reason than its dishonesty. Crosby. Uh, so I want to toast the coalition that's put on the June election uh, ballot, uh, an initiative with a 50 percent cap on tax incentives, a corporate uh, 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 tax incentives, which Kansas City is providing $153 million to the wealthiest uh, people and their developers. Uh, it, it, Kansas City needs to stop doing this. I think a majority of people in the city believe that, so a toast to the coalition. Quickly, Patrick. Quickly, I'm going to roast all five of us sitting around this table because we didn't talk about the fact that the Attorney General of the United States was found in contempt by a House committee yesterday and is likely to be held, found in contempt by the entire House very shortly. That is a national crisis. We didn't say a word about it today. Just like the Attorney General during the Obama administration was found in contempt of Congress, Eric Holder. Still Correct. working that and, and made it, And held accountable. As uh, this one should be. Well, no. How he how is he held accountable? Courts. How is Holder held accountable? Yeah, they found him in contempt, and, and, and he, he did and he nothing turned, happened. And, and that's and ruckus. We got to go. We're back next Thursday at seven. Mike Shannon saying thanks for watching and good night.